I used to think about, oh, what am I gonna sing? What if it's the wrong song? What if, what am I gonna wear? What if it's the wrong thing to wear? What if, well, you know, now I don't worry about that. We all have those moments where we need a little encouragement to get through our day. Someone to remind us that we are not alone. Find peace. Embrace joy. Seek God daily. Welcome to Jesus Calling Stories of Faith. Today, we speak with country gospel singer Susie McIntyre Eaton. Susie grew up in rural Oklahoma, the youngest of four kids in a family who worked their ranch and competed in rodeos across the state. Susie learned to sing from a young age, harmonizing with her siblings. She recalls the stories of her early music days, touring with her sister Reba, and meeting her husband on the rodeo circuit. When she became pregnant with her first child, Susie's marriage took a turn she never expected. She candidly shares how she struggled with years of abuse and shame. I'm Susie McIntyre Eaton. I live in Oklahoma. I've been singing for over 30 years professionally. The McIntyre family has lots of dynamics. Um, we were raised on this ranch. Uh, we were also raised up going to rodeos because my daddy was a rodeo cowboy. And then we learned how to sing going to these rodeos. And so all of those meshed in together to be able to catapult us into three different kind of careers, the, ro the rodeo, the ranching, and then the singing. And it's amazing to me how it all comes together. My grandpap, whose name was John McIntyre, who lived just up the road two miles at Limestone Gap with his wife, Alice, uh, they had daddy, that's the only child they ever had. And my grandpap was uh, champion in 1934 because he won Cheyenne Frontier Days in Cheyenne, Wyoming. My grandpap was, um, he didn't want much. He liked the notoriety of being a champion. He liked his friends. And by the time he got home from a rodeo, he had already spent it all. Uh, he gave it to people. He spent it on, on uh, going out to eat or whatever. You know, he was very free with his money. So daddy saw that and he said, I don't want to be that way. I want to have something for my work. And so daddy was very studious about his practicing, his, um, his ethic of work as to rodeo, and he had a purpose of his rodeo money. What he won on the rodeo circuit, he brought back home to southeastern Oklahoma, and he bought land and cattle. That's all he wanted to do. He wanted a ranch where he could have cattle. After he and Mama got married, they had us four kids in five years. My older sister Alice was five when they brought me home from the hospital. And so she was busy. I mean, she was extremely busy. And it was hard to take that many kids on the rodeo trail, but every once in a while we would get to go, and especially the trip was to go to Cheyenne Frontier Days in Cheyenne. And uh, we have very, very fond memories of being underneath the grandstand. It was all so, so fun, but also meshing in with the music, those kind of trips were when we really, really learned to sing. Daddy being that only child, he wasn't raised up around kids. He was raised around a lot of adults. And so his fuse was just a little bit short. You know, he was concentrating, getting down those roads, two lane roads with the wide trailer on the back. And it was a lot of responsibility and he would get a little short fused. And so to keep things harmonious, mama would teach us how to sing and sing three-part harmony. So, I mean, what a gift that was to be able to learn how to sing and, and how to sing harmony. And we didn't really go to school to hear that, and it wasn't with instruments. It was just with our hearing the notes. And when Daddy wasn't rodeoing, he was out managing his cattle, fixing fence, doing things like that, and trying to build his ranch. Mama stayed home with all of us until I was just about to go into school. 
So I was too small to go to the first grade. So mama made sure that when daddy couldn't keep me on the ranch, if he was too busy or if he had something going on that was too dangerous for me to be around, um, she would tell Gene Wilson, the school bus driver, ask him to come by, pick me up with one of the other kids and take me by grandma and grandpa's house. When that bus hit the cattle guard and straightened out to go to grandma's house, my heart was just full of anticipation. I'd get off that school bus and my Aunt Georgie would get on because she was still in high school. And my grandma always had hot cocoa on the stove. And the greatest, the greatest honor grandma let me have was one time she was sewing on her Singer sewing machine. And it was the one that you push the pedal and you could stop it with your hand up here. And she let me push the pedal for her. Now, I didn't realize that she had, a, she had a break on it right here and she could keep me from hurting her at any time, but she honored me and trusted me that I would be able to push that pedal on the bottom. She taught me lots of things. She taught me respect for her. She taught me respect for the church. And uh, she just, everything about her emanated Christ. And I think to myself now, as I keep my, grand, my little granddaughters, that I want to be the same kind of influence on them that she was with me. In fact, she led Reba to the Lord on the, on the pond dam. They were fishing one time. And um, she didn't rely on church for Christ to be honored. She honored him all the time. So I'm very honored to be able to um, have been in her house at the age that I was. It, it was a huge, uh, boost to me as a woman. But my, my grandma and grandpa's house was a haven to me because I believe that being in a household with three older siblings and as close as we were, I, I tended to be kind of pushed aside because I was, I was younger and we had lots of cousins around all the time. We were either at their house, they were at our house, and I was the youngest trying to keep up. And uh, I didn't realize until the last probably year that that influenced my life a lot because I was the baby of all the kids. Ranch life caused all of us to have to be on a horse every once in a while, you know, uh, but the older ones were on horses more than me. Well, they were older than me for one. And I don't think any of us really got a riding lesson I think we just got on a horse and started going. Uh, but it seemed like to me that every time I got on a horse, I got hurt. And so I would, um, I would just kind of go away from that. I didn't want to be on that horse. So my, my journey was a little bit different. I was a little more studious than the other kids, I think. By the time I was in the fourth grade, I had made 100s on all of my spelling tests. And my teacher, Mrs. Roberts, in, entered me into the spelling bee at school. And so out of Kiowa, from fourth through eighth, I won the spelling bee. And so it was like, this is my forte. I'm not a rancher, I'm not a rodeo person. I'm gonna be somebody different in this family. So that was the kind of the, the different path that I took from those guys. I really didn't want a rodeo. I didn't want to do much ranching, but I'll sing a little bit. I started in the band about seventh grade when I got over to the high school building, and we all had one hour to be able to have music class. And we would be in the cafetorium where there was a stage and we had our musical instruments and everybody had to sing lead on at least one song. And so that stretched me a lot. I decided to go to Oklahoma State University and um, I took one singing class, and of course they had the, the big numbers and all this kind of stuff, and it was almost not opera, but it was, you know, it was hard and it wasn't country, and I was like, what are you trying to do to me here? And they were trying to expand me and get me in higher octaves and all this kind of stuff, and finally the music teacher just said, uh, this is not working for you, you're too country. And I said, well, coming from southeastern Oklahoma, what do you expect? So I, I pretty well laid singing down, and I thought that's not going to be a part of my life. 
I graduated from Oklahoma State and put out some resumes and I went to work for an oil lease company in Oklahoma City. And then Reba was on the, the trail doing her music and she called me one day and she said, would you consider coming home and being my companion and my backup singer for me? And I said, you bet, I'll do that. I will absolutely do that. And so I moved home. And in the meantime, I uh, met my future husband at the National Finals Rodeo in, in Oklahoma City. Reba was singing the anthem, and then we were singing um, for the dance afterwards there at the Myriad in Oklahoma City. And um, we dated for a little while and ma uh, married in November of 1981. It was, it was cool traveling with Reba. It was, she's always fun. She's, she takes care of business, you know, and she was fun on stage to sing with. Uh, but I was with her when she got her first bus. And um, that was the most cool thing. You know, I, I, the, of all the bragging rights I have, being on the Johnny Carson show with her and being with her when she got her first bus was, was the f neatest things you know, to be able to have those two milestones with her, you know, and going on those radio tours with her. And it, I think I learned so much from her, um, her work ethic and everything. And that too, I think God had a part in, you know, I could have bor been born in any other family. I could have been born, you know, in any other country, in any other part of the world, but he chose to put me here in this part of the country with this family, with a sister like her who paved the way. And um, I mean, my career, I, I don't discount God in any of that. In fact, I think he placed me where I'm supposed to be. I got pregnant with our first son, EP. And so I went home and, um, worked for her in her office and everything was going really well. And, um, and then my brother called me and said, hey, would you like to partner with me? Let's, uh, let's do a duet career. And so um, I was already having trouble in my marriage. Um, in fact, had we got married in November by March, we were, uh, there was emotional, verbal, physical abuse in our marriage. My husband was very jealous uh, when I would when I would work for Reba, he would ask me how well how long does it take for you to get from her house to this house? What what are, what's going on? Or well, who did you talk to? You know, just an insecurity and um, a jealousy that was mounting. And um, by the time the rodeo at Fort Worth, I remember one morning uh, he just flew off the handle, and um, I had had EP by then, and um, he was a little baby and, and uh, you know, slammed the door and kicked the door. Uh, I went in the bedroom and he kicked the door off the, the hinges and just a, a real uncontrollable type of, um, of anger. And so a rage, just a rage off of nothing, you know. And uh, so as I've, I've learned about that, there were things in his past that he was still processing and still angry about. His parents uh, had an abusive relationship and uh, so he was raised about around that all of his life. When the abuse first started, I immediately took it on myself that I was doing something wrong. And with my personality, it comes out as how can I fix that? How can I fix this situation to make him happy? and not hurt me and not hurt these kids. And so it, it put me on alert constantly. But the first time it happened was on, uh, we took a trip to Mexico and I don't really know how he, why, what happened, why he got angry. But uh, I was wanting to go to bed. I was wanting to go to sleep. We'd had an argument. I don't even remember what it was about. But if I tried to lay down, he would pull the sheets off the, the bed and he would pull me and he pulled me around the, the uh, apartment with the, the back of my hair. And I just didn't understand it. So the first time it happened was in that situation and I took it upon myself, I'm going to fix this situation. Instead of confronting it and saying, no more buddy, this ain't gonna happen to me, I went under it 
and um, I'm not saying that I caused it, but I enabled it for many years. There's many kinds of abuse. There's uh, what ours started out with was um, the control. Uh, my ex-husband was not in any way abusive when we were dating. He was happy-go-lucky. He was uh, very spiritual. He read his Bible. He did all these things. He got up and spoke about his testimony in front of the cowboy church services. He was a rodeo cowboy. Um, there's emotional abuse. I mean, that tore at my heart. I mean, I was accused of cheating, of being unfaithful. There's um, the mental abuse, the emotional abuse, the physical abuse, which everybody can see. And then there's the spiritual abuse. You've married me, you can't get out of this. Me being in the limelight, that abuse of marriage lasted for 26 years and three children. And I got to the point that I was so stressed that I couldn't even open my mouth to sing. I was just locked, locked up. I, you know, I was just overloaded and we had kids and they were rodeoing, they were doing uh, school activities and all these kind of things. And, and um, I was singing, I mean, I, it was just, it was a boatload for me and so, uh, Paul came in that day and asked me a question, and I couldn't answer him. And um, he began to cuss me and tell me how inept I was. And in fact, you're ugly, and you're, you, you just, you're stupid, and you can't do these things. And da 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 da. -da. And as I sat there and watched him, and I just kind of just asked God, please get him out of my life, please. I can't take this anymore. He rode off on his horse that day, and uh, I went on into the bedroom, and I, I laid on my bed, and I cried and cried and cried, and I said, God, why don't you do something? I mean, we'd written a book. We'd been to all kind of conferences, all kind of counseling, and nothing was changing. But the heart, my heart was still just being ripped out and demeaned, and you know, and it's like, God, do something. And in the quietness of my heart, he said, why don't you? And it was like God was calling me to be a person of intestinal fortitude, to get some guts. Susie needs to take the reins and run her own life and take up for herself. And so I got up from there and I made the decision. The kids had heard it all. And my older son, E.P., come in and said, Mom, what are you going to do about this? And I said, well, I'm going to ask for, this was the second separation. I'm going to ask for a separation and we'll go from there. And so as the year wore on, <clears throat> I realized that I wasn't, that I wasn't even seeing colors anymore. <laughs> My world was gray. And when he walked out and I made that decision in 2007, something I thought I would never do, I filed for divorce. I started seeing color in my life. And I hadn't seen it for 20, probably 20 years. That's how oppressive that abuse can be. And I wouldn't want anybody to live like that. My stance now is to also talk to women who are being abused and men who are being abused. First, to stand up for yourself to call it what it is, it's abuse, and to not stand for it. Because it's, um, it, it's demeaning, it uh, tears your heart up, it uh, has a lasting effect on your family and on your children. And um, so I would ask the people who are being abused is to get help 
to get out of that situation, get to a safe spot and do something. As Susie forged into a new chapter of her life, she began to sing again. And as she was traveling, she also found love again with her now husband, Mark Eaton. She talks about how, through the love of her husband, the strength of her faith, and the support of her family, she has become stronger and wiser, and how grateful she is for this new season of life. I can't thank God enough for that chance meeting in Cannon Beach, Oregon, to find the love of my life, who is such a huge part of my life right now. For him to bring me full circle, and then have me marry a man from the state of Washington who didn't know the difference between a Hereford and a Heifer, I mean, that's pretty awesome. It's just, it's just, it's just dang right funny. That's all it is. It's just funny and ironic how God works. He's got a great sense of humor. Mark started singing with me, and I, I literally felt myself relax when he would come on the stage. It's like, it's kind of like the pressure's off me. I'm not the focal point now. And then when Mark said, God smiles when you sing, it's like, really? You mean he would continue to love my singing even when anybody else quit? And so that really, really warmed my heart. That was an awesome thing to say to me, to encourage me to continue no matter what. Susie and Mark now partner together as they travel to churches, rodeos, and other events to share their music and preach the gospel. They talk a little bit about the beginnings of cowboy churches and their love for people in rodeo and the Western sports world. Uh, the cowboy church is really a three-fold phenomenon. It's, it's what happens once a year at a rodeo. They have their cowboy church. It's the TV show that Susie uh, co-hosts and, and indeed is, was the founder of that shows on RFD two or three times a week. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's the local expression uh, of a church body that meets weekly where, uh, for example, uh, a rodeo would happen in that community and some of the folks would say, we love Cowboy Church, why don't we start doing it every week? Mm -hmm. And so the, eventually they build a building, usually instead of without, with a basketball court or a multi-purpose room, there's a roping arena. And uh, these cowboy churches now are probably in every state. Of course, they're the biggest in Missouri and, and Texas. Texas and Oklahoma. Oklahoma and through the west here, the south central. But uh, we run into them all over the place. And mm -hmm. they are, uh, uh, they usually have a pastor who has some Bible school training, but he's got a whole lot of life training. They're usually evangelistic uh, in their focus and uh, so they get uh, uh, attract a group of people who really are new to church. The other group they attract are men. Uh, right. the, the rough stock guys that uh, uh, maybe don't have very polished up language or polished up look or, or feel like they're polished up uh, can go to a cowboy church and uh, feel pretty good about themselves. Uh, they wear their hats, they wear their boots, they can rope in the arena after the service. Um, and they can meet with some like-minded people. And the pastor, most of the time, has some of his own cattle. Uh, he probably ropes, he knows how to ride, and he understands the Western lifestyle, uh, meaning he knows the, the lifestyle of the cowboys. So rodeo was good to us, and it, it carried on. My older sister, Alice, was a barrel racer. My brother was a rodeo cowboy, he roped calves, he team roped, he steer roped. Um, Reba ran barrels for a while and until Daddy looked at her one day and said, Reba, why do you want to do something that you're not good at? Why, why don't you sing? I mean, look how you can sing. Go do singing. I was the only one that didn't rodeo. Of course, I got hurt when I got on a horse and I shied away from that and I went my own way. But um, rodeo didn't stop there. My older sister's uh, son, Vince, he rodeoed uh, in high school, and um, my two boys have rodeoed. Uh, my older boy was uh, in the collegiate championship team at Vernon, Texas for college rodeo. Uh, they won the championship. My son Samuel high school rodeoed. He didn't go to college. But uh, two years ago, he won uh, in the World Series team roping. He won the number 10 roping, and it was the biggest pot uh, of money to be won up to that point. 
And then my daughter, Lucasi, was like more like me. She didn't want anything to do with rodeo. Um, she participated some, but it wasn't in her heart. And so she went into esthetician school, she went into food preparation school, and now she has her own beauty salon in a town just north of us. So all of my kids are doing very well. Uh, they're still running the ranch as it is today because my dad passed away a few years ago. And we're keeping it in the family. And as I sang at daddy's funeral, um, carry on the cowboy way. Hot and tired and dusty and cold to the bone Through the wind and rain and lightning And through the blowing snow Sit tall in the saddle You be kind You were born to carry on So carry on the cowboy way you were born to carry on, so carry on the cowboy way. <laughs> Susie and Mark find inspiration in the pages of Jesus Calling. She shares a favorite passage and why it speaks to her. Uh, it's April 26th, uh, and it covers 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, and then Psalm 89, 15. And it says, welcome problems as perspective lifters. Uh, to me, that says uh, there, it's not going to be a downer, but it's going to be an uplifting thing. Uh, I've got a, an album called Count It All Joy, um, and it, it says, count it all joy, this trial you're in. And it's uh, an amazing song that just encourages people that whatever they're going through, you will be better for it. It's gonna develop characters, characteristics in you that you never thought possible. If you encounter a problem with no immediate solution, your response to that situation will take you either up or down. You can lash out at the difficulty, which I would do. It's, the, it's its fault and it's not good for me and I'm mad at it resenting and feeling sorry for yourself. This will take you down into a pit of self-pity. Alternatively, the problem can be a ladder, enabling you to climb up and see your life from my perspective. God's perspective is a lot higher than ours, and he sees a lot of problems from his perspective. And, and even though our problems may not be anything like people in Africa or the people in Syria or people in third world countries that are having to walk 10 miles just for a gallon of water, our problems are still important to God. Um, viewed from above, the obstacle that frustrated you is only a light and momentary trouble. Once your perspective has been heightened, you can look away from the problem altogether turn toward me and see the light of my presence shining upon you. So forever keeping all our eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, the one who brings that light to us that our problems seem to pale in, in his presence. And we're never, ever, ever, ever alone. And Mark there for a while was, um, was teaching on this and a lot of times you would say if you keep your keep looking at your problems or your circumstances from five feet and not look at them from 30,000 feet you you'll get overwhelmed can you expound just a little bit about that um yeah it's a real simple principle it's from from five feet above the ground we look down and all we can see is right what's right below us but when we fly in airplanes and we get 30 feet, 30,000 feet in the air, mm -hmm. we can see, oh, wow, um, that river goes there and it hits that ocean there. We can see a much bigger perspective. And so I, I really like being sure we keep the 30,000 foot um, view in mind uh -huh. uh, when we, we keep the long haul in mind when we have issues that might be right in front of us. Right. And that keeps the little fender bender we have in perspective. 
uh, that keeps the little Ill, the illness or sickness that we have in perspective. Uh, we don't tend to lose our minds over what won't even be a bleep on the scale of our history in a few years. Sarah writes here, expect to encounter adversity in your life, remembering that you live in a deeply fallen world. Um, that is such an important perspective. Our day is not going to go the way we want it to. And we have this idea it was a good day or it was a bad day. Well, to me, every day's got not divided up into good and bad, but easy and hard. Uh, life is really tough, and adversity comes every single day, and it should come every single day. I would hate to, to know myself or to hang out with people who had never had adversity. I wouldn't want to be around them. I want to be around people who have scars, who are willing to talk about them and not afraid to show them. They're, uh, they're beauty marks mm -hmm. in my mind, and I love the stories. Every scar has a story, and I want to know the story. To learn more about Susie McIntyre Eaton and her ministry, please visit susiemcintyre.com. And if you're in the Las Vegas area during the National Rodeo Finals, December 6th through 16th, the Jesus Calling team will be at the Stetson Country Christmas located at the Sands Expo. Come and visit with us at the Jesus Calling booth, number 109, where you can also meet your favorite stars of rodeo and country music. Susie and her husband Mark will be stopping by and will also be leading a cowboy church on December 9th at South Point Hotel and Casino, as will other stars of rodeo and country music. For a complete schedule of who will be at the Jesus Calling booth during the National Finals Rodeo, go to jesuscalling.com slash rodeo. Next time on Jesus Calling Stories of Faith, we visit with Texas country superstar Aaron Watson. He is celebrating the release of a new Christmas project, an Aaron Watson Family Christmas, and shares thoughts on how Christ is central not only to the season, but to his whole life. You know, I think it's important during Christmas that you, while there's trees and there's presents, I think it's important to make Jesus the sole focus of Christmas and it's 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 the birth of Jesus but when when you talk about the birth of Jesus you, you're talking about the beginning of his life and and the journey and which leads into the lessons and the footsteps you know which leads him to the cross so I love that it, it, it keeps you focused on the true meaning of Christmas Thank you for watching Jesus Calling Stories of Faith. Be sure to join us every first and third Sunday of each month for a new Jesus Calling Story of Faith, debuting live on the Jesus Calling Facebook page. You can also find our stories on the Jesus Calling YouTube channel and on Instagram's IGTV through the Jesus Calling Instagram page. Be sure to subscribe to the Jesus Calling YouTube channel by going to youtube.com slash Jesus Calling Book so you can be notified when a new story of faith is available.